Oh, hello, hello, and welcome to the Movie Trap. My name is Russell Carlson, and with me, as always, are my friends and co-hosts, first being Chris Boroff. Are you cool, man? <laughs> and also point of this uh, part of this joint subcommittee, uh, my other friend and co-host, Zach Power. Oh, fuck, I forgot about the quote thing. I guess I'll go with all right, all right, all right. <laughs> <laughs> Um, okay, so on the movie trap, one of the hosts you just met picks a theme, and then each of us picks a movie based on that theme. Uh, some of us are a little bit more online with the theme than the others. <laughs> uh, and so we are in the middle of round movie number two of Chris Bora of Zach Powers' theme of summer themes. Um, basically how this works is once we watch all three movies, uh, then we will then vote on which one is our favorite movie with an allocated amount of points, plus some bonus points along the way. Uh, and whichever host's movie wins the vote, that host gets to pick the next theme. Um, so that's where we are today with our summer craze, uh, dog days, hot summer, everything's kind of party groovy-ish. Uh, with uh, Chris Borov's pick of Days and Confused, because previously we went for a kind of similar vibe. Uh, rather than the last day of school, we are going with the last day of summer camp with Wet Hot American Summer from Zach Powers. So here we are today in Link Letters, Days and Confused. It's a cult, both movies cult classic, so we're into that. Uh, before we get into the very, uh, shall we say, this is going to be a meandering plot summary uh, of this movie, because uh, the plot itself... Uh, you know, kind of takes a live a, a stroll. Uh, anyway, so uh, Chris Borough, you have 11 points for final voting and three bonus points to give out. I have three bonus points and 11 points for final voting. And Zach Powers was uh, Santa Claus last round and he only has one bonus point to give out and 10 for final voting. So with that in mind, Zach, why don't we go ahead and get our papers rolling and spark up a doobie and blast some Ted Nugent. What do you say? Uh, sure. Maybe not Ted, but, um, <laughs> otherwise sounds good. Stranglehold, that song, that song's pretty cool. Uh, about the man. He's, he's an asshole, but <laughs> love Stranglehold. That song's cool. Uh, all right. Uh, 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 Days of Confused. It's a 1993, uh, coming of age comedy high school kind of movie directed by Richard Linklater young Richard, Richard Linklater. Uh, it stars Jason London, uh, a young Ben Affleck and Mia Jovovich, uh, Cole Hauser, Parker Posey mixed up in there, uh, Matthew McConaughey in his breakout role, uh, you know, uh, a few and other... Uh, Anthony Rapp? Anthony Rapp pre-rent is, uh, is in there. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, uh, all of these folks. Uh, playing a cadre of uh, high school students in 1976, Austin, Texas. Uh, um, it's the last day of school, uh, and uh, the the seniors are preparing for the hazing of the incoming middle schoolers of the 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 next year, which generally involves a pretty severe paddling. The most ardent of the paddlers being played by Ben Affleck as O'Banion, a fellow who's been held back at least one year before, uh, a mean, stupid brute, uh, sort of, uh, uh, if you've read it, like a, a Henry Bowers light, you know? Um, uh, yeah. Uh, uh, Your standard Stephen King bully. <laughs> yeah, I mean, he's not as bad. He's not yeah. going to carve his name yeah. into your flesh and murder he, the fuck out of you. But He doesn't yeah. really have teeth. Like, for one thing, when we go through this, not a lot of teeth in this movie. A lot of stuff yeah. happens, not for a lot sure. of consequences happen, which is kind of okay. Hmm. But yeah, so when we're saying Stephen King bully, he's not going to actually murder anyone. Yeah, he's, uh, you know, he's, and he's not under the influence of an ancient evil clown, so that helps. <laughs> um, uh, yeah, but uh, meanwhile, uh, the the football team is asked to sign a uh, pledge to avoid drugs and alcohol and the sort, but uh, the star quarterback, Randall, quote, Pink Floyd, uh, refuses to sign such a pledge. Um 
uh, and an act of, you know, young person defiance, uh, even though everybody else in his team does, uh, even though they don't really plan to follow it. Um, the, the freshman girls also get kind of hazed a little bit by um, young Renee. I think Renee Zellweger is in this scene. Um, I think it was uh, Joey Lauren Very Adams. Briefly. Oh, okay. That's who I'm thinking of. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Joey Lauren Adams. The Renee Zellweger shows up a little later, I think. Um, I'm sorry, folks. I uh, watched this movie about a week ago, and it's uh, it's a real like <laughs> stream of conscience. You know, it's got that link ladder aspect. So sometimes I sure you yeah. bet. Yeah. Uh, but uh, we also meet one of our main protagonists, uh, Mitch Kramer, who is one of the incoming freshmen trying to escape his his uh, imminent paddling. Um, and while he does uh, get away for a moment, uh, he is eventually cornered by Fred uh, and some others and is pretty severely paddled. Um, uh, uh, Pink gives Mitch a ride home and uh, offers to take him out to some of the big parties for the seniors that night as sort of a, a, an amends. Um, also encouraged him. He's like, hey, buddy, you should go out there to show that it's not such a big deal. You got horrifically beaten in front of people. You got to go back out there and be a man. That sort of thing. Yeah, exactly. He's like, it happens to everybody. It happens to me, etc. cetera. Um, uh, but the big main plan for the party is derailed when the liquor arrives too early to uh, one of the fellow's parties and his parents uh, decide to stay in to thwart his attempts to have a big ass kegger at his house. So, uh, everything's kind of up in the air. Um, meanwhile, uh, a group of kids who are a little on the nerdier side named Cynthia, Tony, and Mike um, also uh, elect to come out to uh, to the, to the uh, goings on of the final night of school. Um, uh, joining along the way is also David, who is an older guy in his early 20s, who still hangs out consistently with high school students, played by Matthew McConaughey, uh, probably the most famous character from this movie. Um, uh, and, uh, you know, he picks up Mitch and uh, Pink and the rest, and uh, uh, they head for an, the Emporium, which is a nearby pool hall uh, full of teenagers. Um, where they kind of just hang out for a while. They get hamburgers, they play pool. Um, uh, Mitch meets uh, Julie, uh, who he has a crush on. Um, uh, and they cruise around with Pink and, and the others. Uh, Mitch eventually has his first taste of beer, his first marijuana. Um, they bash in some mailbox and get a gun brandished by a nearby neighbor. Um, and then uh, eventually return to the pool hall uh, where Mitch meets his other middle school friends. And they decide to get revenge on uh, Fred O'Banion. Uh, they manage to uh, trick him like with some live bait who he's gonna paddle. Uh, but instead he gets a bucket of paint dumped on his head and leaves both the scene and I believe the movie uh, in a fit of rage. Pretty sure that's his last scene. Yeah. Uh, but uh, having failed to get the party, the house party going, uh, the kegs do manage to get uh, delivered to the moon tower, uh, a big sort of water tower nearby. Um, and most of the senior class arrives there for uh, a big kegger. Um, uh, including the three geeks. Uh, Mike is sort of threatened by a, by a bullyish figure. Um, uh, and uh, another one of the geeks, uh, Tony, uh, meets up with Sabrina, uh, someone, one of the girls who talked to him earlier uh, when she was being hazed and proposed marriage to him as, uh, as mm -hmm. they are forced to do. Um, and they sort of take a liking to each other, um, et cetera. Uh, um, yeah. Uh, Mike confronts the, the bully who uh, 
attacked him earlier, uh, beats him around a little bit, but... Uh, yeah, he gets some liquid courage built up, talks himself yeah. into it, and then promptly gets his right. butt kicked, which is kind of... Yeah, yeah he gets the shit coming. beat out of him in return. Yeah. Yeah. Um, um, yeah. Uh, uh, Pink is asked by one of his co-players about why he refused to sign the pledge, and Pink is uh, sort of... Uh, he's like, it, it violates my ideals and all that kind of shit. Um... <laughs> Mitch eventually manages to leave with Julie, the girl he had a crush on earlier, and they make out a little bit. Um, uh, uh, and uh, yeah, the Tony, one of the geeks makes out with her friend. Uh, Tony manages to make out with uh, Sabrina a little bit as well. So it's a, a night of love and laughter and beatings and kegs. Um, and Pink and his friends... Family. Uh, stay up uh, later and go back to the football field where they get high on the football field. But the police arrive, uh, seeing them there, um, and they call the coach. Uh, coach tries to get Pink one last time to sign the pledge, um, but Pink refuses and says maybe he'll play, but he is never going to sign the pledge. And they decide to head out to try and get Aerosmith tickets as Mitch at the break of dawn arrives home to his mother, who has been waiting up for him. Um, she takes it easy on him, but says never to do that again. Uh, and Mitch goes to his bedroom, listens to Slow Ride, as Pink and his friends head out of town <laughs> to get their tickets to Aerosmith. That's basically dazed and confused. Mm -hmm. You did it. Good job. Um, yeah, because if I don't know we can go into Linklater and his kind of style of movies, but they are these kind of, like you say, kind of stream of consciousness vignettes mm -hmm. of like a certain- I had, I had a little thing pulled up to, 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 to kind of guide, guide my tracks on this one. Usually I don't, usually I just go off right. the cuff, but Well, yeah. Linklater has always done right. this. But this even, is, this even is definitely I, I his only... deal. It's always like a, a peripatetic story that goes all over the place. Um, his first big one was a movie called uh, Slacker, which basically it's a really strange story. He made it as a student uh, running around Austin, or maybe he wasn't even a student yet, but basically it is not a narrative. It's like you'll have a scene in which a character enters, they talk about something, there will be a small vignette scene, they talk to people, then someone from that scene leaves the scene mm -hmm. and then the next scene starts with whoever left coming into that next scene and then it's a completely different vignette about something else and it was all about the wacky weirdos all over Austin so it, it's sort of this thing that he's continued through his career uh, not really telling straightforward narratives as much as character studies that kind of take a swipe at a whole swath of people or at a big bunch of ideas uh, so it's very much if you like that sort of thing you're gonna be into it if you're not into that sort of thing eh, you might want to put this one back on the shelf yeah i, I mean there's I, there's bits in this movie that are like i think have and you know there's certain movies where like things from them have entered the common vernacular and there's pieces and bits from this movie where that is certainly true uh, as a cohesive narrative it's like it's you know, very much just sort of it's 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 more so than a lot of Linklater's movies, like pretty cohesive. Like, you know, it's just that first love, first drink, first beer, like the Mitch storyline, you know, is pretty, you know, telling. Uh, I it's mean, similar it's to like clear. American Graffiti. Yeah, exactly. Or even like a um, movie like a 90s like can't hardly wait or any of these things that are like 24 hours uh, on the last day of school where you have mm -hmm. to or the first day of school where you have to like kind of realize your dreams and come of age and it's definitely enjoyable um the sequence of events and maybe this is a little like remembering that time in your life like doesn't always click in your mind when you remember back to it but you remember the moments it's kind matter. of watching it's like watching Groundhog's Day a little bit yeah. like you dip in and there's a scene you're like I don't know where this is in the flow but I kind of get it um, yeah well yeah. okay all right all the movies that you guys listed have more of an actual like goal than as characters trying to achieve um this movie has nothing of the kind um it's pretty much just 
how are we going to get through the day? You know, or what's the party situation? Yeah, going everybody like, wants to go to a big party around. and and that's right. that's kind of the main I mean, thrust of the movie. You know, but like movies like Can't Hardly Wait, there is a through line. There's a, you know, there's sure. a path that the audience has taken on. Numerous this characters one, the, have goals there, in that There movie. is, there is, that's why I wanted to ask you guys, like, I kind of like, what's the legacy of this movie? Is this movie meant for like us when we were kids in the 90s? Or is this made for our parents to try to remember the back in the day that's an interesting you know, question like, because like, this I, is... I wonder who this movie is made for this uh, is one of I those remember this movie being exposed to me when i was graduating the eighth grade into high school that's when i first discovered this movie um and it it's not like it resonated with me i mean it was easy to watch and i i was more or less forgettable by the end of it i thought it was weird that ben affleck was in it i guess um and the fifth element lady but um yeah i uh, i i don't know i just don't know who this movie is actually for okay well so let's just uh the thing the thing about that is this is i think i don't know if there's science behind it but i think it's pretty fucking apparent just on like a empirical level that the nostalgia cycle is very real yeah like this movie 20, came out for sure yeah, yeah this movie came out in 93. It takes place in 76, about 20 years earlier. I mentioned it during my um, roundup. That's another example of a, a work where, um, you know, that came out in the uh, mid 80s. And uh, Stephen King is writing about the late 50s for a pretty huge portion of that book. Now we've got uh stranger things came out a few years ago and yeah. it's all about mm -hmm. the 1980s like i think the 1980s sure. nostalgia cycle was fucking insane the last eight or seven well, years it's, I, it's I starting it's, to get into the 1990s now yeah i was gonna say i think that the 80s cycle has definitely turned down a bit the thing that i've noticed at work and just in general has been people like borrowing things from the 90s like style elements for some reason cyberpunk like i know the game came out but people became obsessed with yeah. the style of cyberpunk which even in the 90s mm. felt kind of awkward and dumb but you know people are going to wear what they want to wear and i can't I really argue against fashion i think i think like for instance scream has been has come back after a pretty long pretty long time away and i think that's part of like even that because scream when i think of like some of the most 90s movies made scream is in the top 10 and i love scream but right. it's a very but I mean, 90s even, movie. But this is even before, like, that 70s show. And that was still pretty popular among kids my age, too. You know, so, like, it's not necessarily only our parents' nostalgia. That's why I'm kind of asking. Well, it's are just... We watch, you know, like, do we, younger generation watching this in 93, like, just well, relate to this, I the think fun antics and the idea it, of, like, coming to age generally, that's our attraction? Generally, it doesn't alienate, right? Like, uh, when I watched... Right. Well, I read it when I was 12 and I watched um, shows and movies that had like that were like the 70s nostalgia cycle when I was a kid. And like it didn't alienate with alienate me because like the thing that right. people are really trying to reproduce is the feeling of being that age. And that doesn't actually change. Um, Correct. In spite of like the trappings and the social situation and all that shit like fundamentally feeling like a 12 year old or an 18 year old mm -hmm. is it doesn't change and that's it's what these universal. movies do well and the reason these people set them into them there is because now they're 35 or 40 or whatever and that's right the time they knew how it felt to feel like that it's just but but a good one a really good one captures that feeling and this one does mm -hmm. to a to an extent yeah. i think I, sure i would say sure. that like going with that one of the things that like jumps out at me is the fact that just the fact that a story like this and i've noticed a number of summer based stories have similar things to this where you won't have as strong a central narrative as much as many many little sub narratives kind of happening around the side in the same way that like uh, most of summer, at least at the start of summer, is about the endless possibilities in front of you. So you're going through the story and all these different characters are introduced and then they're going different ways and doing different things, different ways people could spend their summers. 
Um, this one to me mostly, I think I would have watched it at that age, um, mostly just going through the uh, emotions of Mitch, but probably also his friends, right? And also the fact right. that like everybody in the movie is talking about weed. Like when I was a kid, <laughs> I was a super square. I would have been like, I don't like these kids. They're into drugs. <laughs> Now I'm an adult, and I'm like, these kids haven't seen enough shit to smoke as much as they do. But the thing is that uh, it is definitely that edge of it. I think that might be the reason. I don't know. How do you guys feel about that? Do you think that, like, the drug use and sort of the open, like, counterculture stuff in this is the reason that it caught the zeitgeist? Because there were lots of other ones that came out. There's, like, you know, uh, American Pie, uh, that nobody did drugs in that as far as I can remember. Uh, uh, they definitely wait, drank. Drink they drank they for drank, sure. Yeah, but no one was drank. smoking. Uh, um, can't hardly wait. Yeah, I, I don't think even everybody think was a teetotaler. Can't hardly in wait. That. I don't. Yeah. Uh, no, I mean. Uh, oh, they can't drank, hardly wait. There's like, a big. Yeah. Uh, um, but I don't remember weed being such a big thing about it. But like, there's also stoners and can't hardly wait. Mm. That's true. Jason Segel um, plays in a very early role. That's right. In, that's right. In a correction, that's right. yes. Right. I don't know what that's I'm talking right. about with that's Ken right. Hardly Wade. I should probably not um, talk about movies I saw last time 20 years ago. Like but I mean, I but, uh, you know, but even 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 in the generation before that, Chris, uh -huh. like the John Hughes, which is like what I think Link Letter Sure, the Breakfast Club has a famous a, weed a smoking photo. scene. But they're all, yeah, right. So, I mean, it's it's all kind of, that's, I think Linkletter's whole purpose of this is to be like a photo negative of The Breakfast Club and like the John Hughes era of like the 80s and stuff. This is supposed to be like a, a photo negative. Whether he, it, the problem is, do you achieve it or not by just kind of meandering around this town with these hijinks of these kids, you know, and with a very, very, you know, not really all that attainable goal or even defined goal other than just, this kid just has to survive and he doesn't even survive halfway yeah, through the movie he gets his ass kicked by Ben Affleck I suspect and you know well it's him the to accept it I suspect the yeah. idea if I may is that the purpose of the movie is you got Pink and you got Mitch and they're the two main characters mm -hmm. uh, yeah. Pink is a fella who knows his identity he's at the end of the high school process he's coming into being a senior he knows his identity so strongly that he won't sign this pledge, this pledge that his fellow teammates have signed and don't right. abide by. You know, they just lie. I mean, their signature means nothing to them. Like, it's fucking nonsense. But he has this strong sense of identity that he is true to who he is internally, that he won't make false these false promises of, like, I ain't going to drink and do drugs. And Mitch is somebody who is pink three years ago on the first day of that spectrum he doesn't quite know where he will be in this system and it's the formation of, a, of an identity like I think it's just two ends of the same character I think that's what they're supposed to be I'll give you a point. Sure. I'm going to give you a point for that because okay. I, right. uh, I hadn't considered that that would be the linking between those two I guess the link came to me yeah, later yeah and also but also, more if I wanted to comment right, very about good, like Chris. the drug I, I heard and I, <laughs> I heard and it happened. <laughs> uh, but I, I also think that uh, going back to the to the weed stuff, I think a part of the commentary that that Link Letter is making in this whole movie is that like we're ten years removed from like the summer of love and shit, or at least like right before it. And I think all these kids are expecting that moment to happen for them. They're like getting ready to go off in the world and there's going to be Woodstock and there's going to be, you know, all sorts of crazy radical shit, but they know, they know better. They already know better at this point that no, no we're just going to get Ted Nugent and Alice Cooper and Led Zeppelin, you know, the, that's the, that's what we've got. Um, you know, so like it, it, I mean, there is a, like an, an inherent disappointment, I think that is ingrained in the seventies that I think this movie captures pretty well considering it was made in the nineties. Well, I mean, do you think that that would be more a feature of the Gen X uh, generation that was making it? For sure. Cause it, thousand percent. Yeah, thousand cause percent. It, like anything where it's like anti-establishment, anti-authoritarian, yeah. anything where it's like, you know, fuck either side, they're both going to be the same. Like that's, that's pretty reminiscent of a lot of stuff from that era. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. And also I think that the idea, like this is part of the, the beginning of the nineties auteur kind of craze, right? You know, like this link letter still made this on his own, you know, this was still more or less an independent movie. Um, 
you know, with like a bunch of basically and unknowns at this point. Truly remarkable. Um, yeah. Like this is one of those movies. I mean, Wet Hot American Summer has this in common, but uh, sure. Like a lot of in common movies that I'm going to bring up with Borovir while I bring out my paddle. And paddle but and yeah, thing. like there's there's a there's there's a number of people uh, in this movie who when this movie came out, no one knew who the fuck they were. And they're they're big deals now and and i think that has that in common with wet hot american summer though i think this was somewhat more successful than wet hot american summer at least yeah uh, this one kind of this, this one was a hit on vhs i think yeah, yeah i think um, this but, is one of those ones that became a big cult classic afterwards wet hot american to, summer it kind of is now i feel like it took 15 years for that movie to become a cult yeah. classic well, on this one, yeah. uh, one of the reasons that the cast is like this could be the cast director or the casting director. Um, mm -hmm. This is a guy that people talked about a lot afterwards because I guess that he just somehow was able to identify people who were really talented and put them in front of Linklater. Um, that guy has since passed away. I think it was a guy named Don Phillips. Yes, Don Phillips. Okay. Which it's a little inside baseball, probably not that interesting to everybody, but he's a casting Are you director. Kidding? That, What's the movie trap, baby? Let's go. <laughs> Well, it's just interesting. He also did Fast Times at Ridgemont High as a casting director to kind of put it in okay. context with okay. what this guy's deal was. Sure. He did a lot sure. of younger um, groups. He also did like Mall Rats, uh, Animal okay. House. Um, oh, wow. Okay, so he really yeah. did run the gamut on these kind of. I mean, well, Animal House. I mean, that was mostly sort of like Lampoon because they had yeah. like Second City and all that shit to draw yeah. from too. Also, Dog Day uh, After but it <laughs> Holy shit. Okay, wow. I mean, Jesus. All right, wow. Um, so, okay, yeah. Th well, Dog Day Afternoon, that... though. Al Pacino and John Cazale, and that's just the oh, Godfather Ernie. casting, right? You know? Yeah. They'd already yeah, been in the Godfather the at not, that point. Not really. No, just two actors from the Godfather. Just two. Yeah. Um, but uh, I think that... Um, and I, I think that's inherently why this movie works, is that I... I you've got a very eager cast you know a very young and eager cast that that is ready to put forward honest proposals and honest performances and are just accepting the proposal that link letter is giving them that like we're just gonna drive around in a truck for a minute you know um listen to some alice cooper and shit um pass around a doobie or whatever um so it's it, it helps it helps develop like rich characters even if those characters don't go through so much a lot of evolution necessarily um well i would you know it seems to me like he's probably kind of giving kids what they want at the time um sure. you mentioned john hughes and one of the but which kids is he making him his him as a kid or us as kids i think it's that that's what i was asking at the beginning i think it's probably a linkage between both like i think it's probably okay. like someone who's got I, i've got to go on a go out on a line and say that I think that Link Ladder specifically has some sort of an intense tie to youth and sort of the memory of it. He did boyhood and things like that. But um, one of the things I found interesting is that his movies tend to be very sympathetic uh, when it comes to the characters. Like he just kind of lets them do what they're going to do. Like even, uh, even the murder movie he did with Jack Black. Um, I can't remember. I think it was Bernie. 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 Isn't that Bernie? Yeah, yeah. Bernie. Uh, he spent a long portion of that movie um, sort of setting you up to be sympathetic to Bernie uh, before, uh, spoiler warning, there's a murder in that movie and Bernie's the culprit. But he does the same thing in Suburbia, which yeah. is a base off of a Bogosian play. Well, one of the but... things I'm kind of noticing in this, when you compare it to John Hughes, is John Hughes tended to do stuff that was so over the top that kids could never do it. Like The Breakfast, the breakfast Club, where they're like climbing around uh, everything in Ferris Bueller's oh, Day Off. Is Ferris just Bueller's is probably the biggest offender. Like, yeah, yeah. Like none of it's real. None of it's possible. And when you really stop and think about it, it's stuff that you might casually daydream about when you're in middle school. But by the time you're in high school and you're at that age, mm. you're really wanting to talk to girls more. You're probably wanting to drink. You're probably wanting to go out and do all sorts of things you're not supposed to do. Not particularly any of the stuff your parents want yeah. you to do. Girls and, or or yeah. any whatever uh, person well, you happen to be attracted to. Exactly, but the sure. th the thing is, is I just see that as a change for this. Like the kids who grew up on Home Alone, you know, going like I don't really connect with this 
you know, Roadrunner nonsense happening in the movie. Sure. This movie comes out and it's way more accessible because you're like, oh yeah, sometimes you get into a car and some guy asks yeah. you if you have weed and you don't have it. Or other times you're trying to get beer. Or holy crap, that Mitch kid just walked in and got the beer, didn't go through any hustle. You're kind of like, oh my God, he's going to get caught. And then he doesn't get I, caught. And as a kid, I would have been like, oh my God, how did he do that? That's fair. Yeah, like, uh, you know, uh, something that uh, I was thinking about recently, uh, because it's the kind of shit that happens when you're 17, 18, is one time me and my friends went to fucking Casa Bonita when I was 17 or 18 and I grabbed an empty margarita glass off the table next to me and I asked the waitress if I could uh, get a refill and they just gave it to me and I was like and I've never forgotten that that I I managed to (laughs) no card get a a free margarita at uh, Casa Bonita when I was 17, 18 years old I mean, that's awesome. That's the sort of story that, that I is think, awesome. like, inspires yeah, stuff like this This movie. is exactly, like, yeah. Um, God. I, I I also remember getting snuck into the back of the theater for Life Aquatic with Steve Zissou. Somebody opened mm. the fire escape, yeah, and I, I came that into trick. the back. <laughs> yeah, but that is what it is I like it being Guy Ritchie age. snatch, but yeah, I had to do the same. And thing. also, what um, a movie to fucking sneak into my, through the back. Yeah. My dad <laughs> took me willingly to Scream Three when I was thirteen years old, and mm. to, but for fucking Life Aquatic, I had to sneak in the back. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> That's was it? Did they just well, not? So was it because was it because you were cheap, or because they wouldn't let you in? Like what was because I was underage. I was. It was well, an R-rated yeah. movie. Oh wow! Yeah. After, Columbine really fucked that all up because I remember before Columbine, like you're I was, telling me, my buddy. Mom, my mom was able to to like yeah right. My mom was able to buy because I remember when they re-released The Exorcist or whatever, and I really wanted to go, and I was underage at the time. My mom absolutely refused, but I could go if she bought the ticket. We could be in there as long as you had a ticket. You just couldn't buy the actual ticket. So my mom would buy me a ticket. She'd go watch, I don't know, Secretariat or whatever. Um, and that we everybody lived in harmony. Everybody lived in harmony. And yeah. then they started requiring, because, you know, fucking anyway. Apple For the listeners, by the way, I, I literally went to Columbine High School, which is right. why I said, <laughs> you're telling me, buddy. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I live. Uh, yeah, that's where I lived. So, but but also like that's what I, we going back to days of confused because like that's sort of why I I I'm if I'm gonna give you a point because I think you're absolutely right that this is the biggest shift between this era and the Hughes era of you know previously of its predecessors is that this did feel like adventures that kids would get into, you know I I I live in a relatively small town and I see kids doing this kind of shit you know and it's fine and i'm like ah ah you kids i remember when i was like that you know so like it it is just sort of part of growing up that especially when you're in high school and those two distinct uh eras of transition between mitch and uh pink um one's about to enter a wider world one's about to enter a slightly wider world um and how you just sort of adapt and adjust to that and that's why I, I think that you're absolutely right because you're seeing shit that kids would actually do like one of my one of the it's a small moment in the movie but like the, the dude runs out of the liquor store with the beer or whatever and it makes it seem like he's just like stole it and he's like go 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 and the guy who they previously busted the mailbox in comes in with a gun he's like give it back to the beer he's like no I, I paid for it <laughs> you know like he just tried to come off as like a tough guy I don't care hooligan and then he's like oh, I know here's my receipt <laughs> yep yeah, that was I bought that completely. Like I've known people who were just like that. Totally. Like a lot of the things that the kids get up into totally. this very much remind me of things kids did in high school. Like even Okay, Boraf. Okay, Boraf. Well, here's one. This is what I that, that's time to take your medicine, but go ahead, I'll let you finish your Here, thought. Here's, I, I do think I he, we ha- we have to have a talk. Well, here's the thing. Like the the not signing the uh the little sheet. Um it's the sort hmm. of like it's micro kind of a, rebellion micro rebellion i would call it a pyrrhic victory at most like what are you gonna do kid you're gonna not sign and then 
the coach well, is going to Well, I give think in this case, it seems like this kid's pretty talented and they're, they need him on the team. So they they're going to they're they cave. But the thing is, I also remember in high school, there was a kid who came to school in a dress and the entire argument was you're uh, getting in the way of my freedom of speech would not take the dress off. Well, I mean, he wouldn't change into pants specifically. And it turned into a whole thing. And it's like, you know, in hindsight, sure, he had a point. No one should really care what this kid's wearing. However, in the middle of 90s uh, Indiana, I don't know if any of the faculty would have been open to changing anything about how they were going to do things. And so... Yeah. It's I mean, these- there is a bigger... I mean, there is truly, like, I don't think this kid was going for it, but yeah, there is, like, you know, now uh, much more so than the 90s, the, though it obviously existed then. Like, trans I mean, rights it's, is it's a, a legitimate, it is a legitimate thing. Like, what he was arguing for was a legitimate thing. I, mean, I don't know if he was arguing for it in good faith or just being a little shit heel. That was the thing I was going to say. Because it's like, it's, it was mostly, I don't want the teachers to feel okay and I want to irritate them and I think that was kind of the core thing in his case it like while I agree now plainly with the entire political thing and I think he even turned out to be like a really cool like a uh, liberal guy that I know um that was not the reason he was doing that at the time he was just doing that to make I think like Mr. Bodner ask him questions they were like why are you dressed in a dress and things like that you know, there's something to be said for that, though. Uh, I pushing agree. the envelope for its own sake. Mm-hmm. Uh, I, I, I mean, you know, one of what in, in my time, like I didn't. The one person I knew who recently passed away uh, was this punk rock guy, and he really kind of pushed me into, like, kind of fuck this for the sake of saying fuck this, um, and and kind of embracing that. And while long term, it's not necessarily uh, sustainable. Uh, but when you're young and you don't feel like you have anything to lose, it is mighty attractive and boy, does it feel good. I think it, um, and I think that is the defining legacy of Gen X and less so success of generations. Um, like the fuck it, it doesn't matter who cares. I think Mm. that both millennial and Gen Z have a lot more like. Uh, it actually matters pretty pretty hugely. <laughs> um, well, it's a different kind thing. of mindset. In, but, in but, Indiana, it didn't feel like anything would change, and it was mostly a question of like, when are you going to have this argument? Like, you only have to be here and deal with these idiots for four years, and then you can go do but, whatever you want. Yeah. But it. Uh, All right, Borif. You bring, keep bringing up Indiana. This is now the second coming of age movie that you have brought up about small town kids being in plucky adventures, getting into trouble, getting into hijinks. Borif, are you just getting old? Are you just looking back on these days, these halcyon days, and, <laughs> and wishing they come back to them? Uh, uh, yeah, I, I, I remember a Chris Borif. I remember a Chris Borif fucking hating these kind of shit. To, and to, like, to, I'm never going back. Fuck this shit. You know? And now he's all like, well, it's kind of charming in its own way. I kind of like it. To, so I, uh, but I, I, do, I do think that just to voice an opinion, like The thing about like the sort of Gen X aesthetic that generally to this day bothers me the most is, and like this is present so much, especially in stuff like uh, South Park, but a lot of Gen X culture is like the idea that caring about anything is fucking lame. I, I genuinely think that's the most horrible thing that Gen X did. Like they had a, you know, they were coming after the boomers and the boomers fucked up a lot of shit. Um, But like their attitude of apathy, I think in the long run was Trump. So detrimental. (laughs) Like it was really bad. And, you know, these like little bits of protestation, you know, that we, you know, talk about as, like sort of like like at the time you said your 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 friend or whatever who wore the dress mm-hmm. like the reaction was to get a teacher to exasperatedly say why are you wearing a dress like now fucking you wear a dress to school you might get some fucking real fashy shit of people mm-hmm. and t- even teachers being like saying real angry 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 hateful shit like mm-hmm. there was a period where it was just like 
why are you fucking around? And it's right. kind of going back to you're a fucking pervert and you need to get. I know this is not what the podcast is about, but I exterminated. Yeah. Well, <laughs> I mean that they, 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 there was a turning point and 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 like it seemed there was a time period where like things started to get more accepting and and it, it seems to be slinging back the other way and I, I wish there wasn't such apathy towards these things at a certain period of American history that is not what this is necessarily about though this perhaps has some relation to the movie uh we can continue on I I think you're but uh, I, I I kind of but I mean, that's that's what's kind of the the irony. This is a Gen X movie about a different generation. Yeah, you know, like that's that's what's kind of the, the interesting the, part the about loosening this of, of the statement. slack, right? Like that's what I think. Right. Dazed and confused yep. is the loosening of the slack, and the slack is maybe mm -hmm. in some regards tightening right now in our country's history, and and I wish that loosening wasn't taken so for granted in some regards. Yeah, I'd like also. I a, mean, we, we I'll loosen give you a point, Zach. The uh, the it's. Uh, I think it is a good point that uh, the the overhanging thing with Gen X has been sort of the uh, apathy and sort of the false uh, false equivalencies of like both sides are the same. Um, yeah, which I think does I think lead to things like Trump. Um, the the main thing I always think of is, I think Trey Parker and Matt Stone to me are like the ap apotheosis of this, yeah. and they had that one like Carrie versus Bush episode of South Park where it was like a douchebag versus a turd sandwich or whatever. And I think I saw that phrase used for over a decade after that episode aired to describe every presidential election, and it was like, yeah, they both. But it's not quite the same between the two. Like, I don't know. I, I. It's not actually like trying to say that both sides are terrible. It's not as contrarian as people think. Yeah. Um, and it's not as as wise and well learned as. Nor is it useful uh, to actually coming up with solutions. Yeah. yeah. Uh, it, it to is, anything. It's the laziest. So. It's the laziest argument. It's the one where I, you don't really have to be on either side of it. You can just say everyone's sure. dumb and sit in the I, corner. I. Yeah. It is fine to have valid criticisms for everybody that's perfectly fine you know like I, lord knows i've got plenty on the democrats that i could of course them. um but this is uh but even on but even and that's where you know you know to bring it back to the movie yeah you're kind of I, and i apologize again where, for going down this road well, I mean, it's the, about the it, feeling of an era in so many ways sure, and i i kind of i guess it, away it's, and, an, it's a testament to the movie that it it sure. made me it invokes like, this uh yeah. A amount of nostalgia, you know, because that's where I think that, you know, and, and, but also I, I think that this is kind of the legacy of this movie, you know, like I, I that's why I would really wanted to kind of couple this discussion around the legacy of this movie. And the Matthew because, McConaughey I character mean, is an interesting example, oh, sure. too. I, yeah, yeah, I mean, absolutely. He, I mean, I knew a guy like that, you know, like that he was just like the cool guy and yeah, he would well, always drive you around. I don't know if I knew car. him as a cool guy. Uh, I knew him as he, the guy who was too old to be hanging out with high school students who wouldn't uh, stop hanging right, out with high school yeah. students. <laughs> sure, but hey, he bought me cigarettes. You know, fucking, I'm good. Um, so yeah. they're like, useful, and if if they're Matthew McConaughey, they're they're attractive. Sure. I, I mean, guess. that's why. I, also, I mean, like we talked about how how kind of like a lot of the cast here is kind of baby versions of themselves, especially uh, you know Mila Jovovich is kind of famously in this movie. I barely noticed her. I, yeah, I, I didn't. Yeah, her. apparently, me too. Apparently, she ended up on the the cutting room floor a lot of the time. But that's why I think sort of the the she's the risk not you a run particularly of, great actress. Right, right. But still, uh, you know, but that's sort of the nature of how I think this production and the editing process of this film went. When you have a movie of this style, where it's basically these orbiting vignettes of random, you know, adventures. Uh, you're going to have to make some tough and you're trying to make it a comedy so you can't make it three hours right so you're going to have sure. to make some tough choices in the editing room um, so I, he has no one to blame for himself for kind of meandering the way that he did because apparently she was in a lot more of this movie than was than what was shown but um, that's the Just that's like the risk the, you, the that's thin the risk red you run line when, when you're making a movie like this the thin red line yeah, is that a movie about the military? Yeah, it had a similar uh, recording the thing. The Terrence where, Malick movie. Yeah, Terrence Malick. There's classically, there's like 
Uh, oh, and, like and it showed. Two, and it showed. Two it hours showed. of like cut footage from that. They had a completely different movie. There's like a character who's like a super famous guy. I think Adrian Brody was originally like the main character of Adrian that movie. Adrian Brody. I think they, it was Jim Caviezel actually. Well, I, well, no, I mean like before they did all the like cutting. Like I guess oh, the original okay. script made it seem like Adrian Brody was the main character, and then it got cut so heavily after the case. Jim Caviezel was the main guy. Anyway, That's similar story where it was sort of a weird. Uh, way in which that guy's editing changed the whole movie and how he shot and all that um mm -hmm. one, one other thing i wanted to get to with this movie because and i brought it up a couple times i i, I love the soundtrack <laughs> I, I know like the rumor is they spent a not so substantial amount of the budget on licensing some of these songs uh you know i sure. mean i counted three alice cooper songs that's that ain't cheap um, and, and you know, you can always see you're pushing out an open door when you play a Black Sabbath, uh, easy one for me. Mm -hmm. And, uh, even the, 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 shall we say, even despite what a scumbag he is, the best of Ted Nugent, if you can call it that. Um, and I've never been a big fan of Aerosmith and I've never understood why people like that band, but people do. Um, so yeah, <laughs> uh, that's, I, I'll say the soundtrack rocks. Um, and it kind of, you know, when I watch this movie, yeah. when I, when I watch this movie, uh, I was Mitch. I was Mitch's age. It was summer, eighth grade. I'm getting ready to be a freshman. Um, and But that, even then, I'm like, this is bullshit. This is not going to come on. They're not going to. And guess what? It was. It didn't happen. Like, by the time you're in high school, really, nobody cares. Nobody, you know, like, that. everybody is more or less chill as long as you're, like, not a complete asshole. I mean, you know, I, I'm going to kind of say this, and I guess I'll let Zach say whatever he wants, and I, we could probably go into final, uh, final thoughts. The, um thing i noticed with this is just the scale and the intensity of like what the consequences were and how the film has like a false realism to it where it feels more true to life than john hughes movies however it is still plainly a movie still playing by movie rules like there's other films uh, or i'll mention a couple tv shows where i've seen that the comedy has this specific thing where it's not a true or realistic response when people say things it's instead still kind of in movie mode so like um wet hot american summer for example has a lot of scenes where people are saying comedy and it's you know sort of broad comedy but you kind of understand it as movie logic and movie yeah. way of telling the story. I mean, story. that's there's a lot of meta comedy in that movie yeah. especially for the time it came out and like a more modern example one that jumped out at me as sort of an example would be uh, a lot of the works of uh i cannot remember her name right now but you guys will probably tell me by the time i'm done speaking uh 30 rock uh tina fey tina fey tina fey 30 rock unbreakable kimmy schmidt uh only murderers in the building reason i mention that is that when you watch any of those though shows, i will say she's not a creator or writer on only murders in the building only yeah, uh, she just only an actor a favor. sorry yeah, it was just yeah. i it stuck out to me because she was in the movie um the thing is is that the reality in those things is usually heightened and there will be something that like would not work in real life that occurs in it um or ways in which people speak where they're very intense and mean to each other and if they said it for real, but because it's a comedy, they just sort of sweep past it and they're on to the next joke before anyone can feel bad. This movie has a little bit of that, but not quite to the same extreme as the John Hughes stuff did. So it's hmm. kind of one of those interesting things where it's like there's stuff in it that doesn't feel quite true to life, but it feels kind of acceptable on emotional level when you're watching it. So like most of the stuff involving like uh, Adam Goldberg's character getting beaten up or how much he's just complaining. Like, if that guy was in real life, I imagine someone would throttle him and say, stop doing that. Hmm. Anyway. But, uh, yeah, go ahead. Uh, real quick, give me about mm, one minute. I really need to go to the bathroom. Okay. Uh, and we'll right. pop back in. Sorry, cool. I just, sure. I gotta cool. do it. Cool. Two in a row, uh, it's a lot. <laughs> yeah, that's all right. Right, back to back. Doing a double header. Yeah, if he, uh... Uh, I see. I'm still rolling. Oh, yeah, I, uh, did it glitch yeah, for a second? I saw I, it, like, yeah, I kind of glitched back. out when he uh, when he was doing the synopsis. So I figured if I just kept quiet and didn't say anything, nobody would notice. Gotcha. And, yeah, uh, it worked. Huzzah! Should be fine. Should be fine. Yeah. Let me put a. Yeah, but I'm glad you like that. Only murders in the building. I just love that show. I just find it completely. It's very silly. Your, your description of it is pretty 
apt. It's just a cozy show. Yeah, yeah. You know, it's it's a, absolutely. It's a very cozy yeah. and fun. I and and I'm usually like I can handle Martin Short on very small doses, but I love him in the show. He is fucking hilarious. Well, it's the perfect show. amount of him. Like his level of irritating yeah. is like part of the character. So it makes sense. Sure. Um, yeah. Yeah. It's yeah. also and, like... I mean, shit, you get Shirley MacLaine out of retirement. Holy shit. You know, I mean, I like that movie. I like that crazy. show a lot. It's... I think the fact that I, I know it is like Sarah a cozy... Thing yesterday. Since it is a cozy, I can kind of get into it. But it's so funny how they talk about podcasts. Like, that part, I'm yeah, just I know like... It. I know. It's so great. It's like this is this is like aliens describing a doctor. Like this is weird. I know. <laughs> um, yeah, it feels like a. It feels like murder. She wrote a bit, like very like sweet and cozy, and everybody's yeah, kind of chill, I mean, and you're not really scared. And like even if someone gets killed, you're like, yeah, but it won't be in a mean way. Um, right, but even the 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 overall mystery of yourself you're still kind of like oh okay all right you know it's it's satisfying and it's it's serious like there's some honest like character shit in there but without being so like dour about it you know it's 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 more or less everybody's just there to have a good time and it, it sounds like this is going to be steve martin's last thing he's ever going to do so um everybody's going to show up i guess oh wow um i didn't uh, i didn't hear yeah, that because i yeah, he he. Well, he just said he's got nothing planned. So oh, anyway, I, Sarah had never seen uh, My Blue Heaven before, and she loves Steve Martin. I'm like, well, you gotta see My Blue Heaven. I oh, mean, that, yeah, just yeah. Just to watch um, Steve Martin try to pass off as a gangster. <laughs> yeah, Steve Martin's hilarious. <laughs> like, uh... I do love Steve Martin. I am. I'm, what are you doing here? It's dangerous for you to be in the frozen food aisle. You're gonna <laughs> melt all this stuff. <laughs> <laughs> I loved uh, I loved the scene where he just started going crazy about uh, um, not Martin Short. Uh, what's the other guy in that? Steve Martin. Oh, Rick Moranis. Rick Moranis. Rick Moranis. Rick Moranis, Rick Moranis oh. sitting on the bed in his dress pants. <laughs> just right. freaking out about it. <laughs> that was a very funny scene. Talking about sorry about that, guys. I, I definitely I'm had to. You. Definitely had oh, to use the bathroom. Void. Oh, Holding yeah, it. I get it. Well, yeah. that's okay. I think uh, once we jump through this, I'm probably going to run off and eat. So, yeah. Uh, okay. Cool. Um, all right, Zach. You probably had a point that we could get to final thoughts. Damn. Uh, damn. Don't, if I remember. Don't have <laughs> all right. Um, much like this movie. Um, yeah. Okay. So I guess we can get into final thoughts. Uh, uh, what the fuck? I'll go first. Um, you know, I feel like every generation kind of has one of these movies, you know, I, 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 whether or not they're movies that are looking backwards or movies that are trying to navel gaze into the current generation. Every generation sort of has this. And that's why I, I sort of think that that Zach messed you up more for picking this movie because he did Wet Hot American Summer and you just got in that mindset of this like you know all right we're gonna do the last i'll do the last day of school and he'll do the last day of camp and it's kind of i mean one's kind of you could summer. you could even argue wet hot american summer is almost like a spoof of this kind of movie yeah um so like it i, I think that that just kind of messed you up why you chose it because there's not too much summary vibes because it basically just is evolves in a whole day it's just yeah. like that you're just following these kids around for a whole day and that's the movie um but it's not without its charm and i think what helps is that a uh, you've got a pretty solid cast with for the most part uh three-dimensional characters like even even ben affleck who's just like this kind of to toothy monster throughout it when he gets the paint dropped off, there's a moment that i sort of like i kind of understood about his character is that part of the reason why he does this is because he got it so bad when he was a freshman and part of the joy of his life and i think he's to inflict that same plane on others yeah he's clearly uh, a very frustrated so... like that character is has been held back a year like it's his second year doing the hazing i think he's probably not a very happy person and is right extremely right. So retaliatory he and uh, i i met his home life shit. melts down yeah and that's why he completely melts down when they pour the paint on him because this is his opportunity to be king for a day and they took it away from him and there's something understandably human about that so like whether or not you think he's a monster or not but I, I, I get where he's coming from um, and I could say the same thing about most of the characters with I guess the exception of Matthew McConaughey other than he's just there to have a keep on living I guess um, 
So yeah, L I V I N. Yeah. Uh, yeah, that, that's my final thought. Uh, Zach, do you want to do one? Sure. Uh, this movie is fun. It's a fun watch. It's an easy fun watch. Uh, there's uh, interesting moments. It taps into like feelings like like all of the Russell said there's one of these for every generation. But like, yeah, like again, I guess I repeat myself, but like the fact that often the ones for a given generation are about a generation before them, like just shows that these are common human experiences that don't change as much as we think they do um uh in spite of trends and 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 even insane technological advances uh the kind of which humanity has never seen in the past 50 to 100 years um like uh, you know and even watching so so there's a show i don't know if you guys have seen this it's called american vandal um it's I've on heard Netflix. Of it. I haven't seen it yet. Oh, I strongly, strongly recommend it. I've only seen the first season. I've only seen the first. Season. Oh yeah, well you, you've seen enough to know. Um, okay. I think that that is perhaps the most accurate reflection of what it is to be in high school that I have ever seen, and it takes place, you know, a number of years after I've been out of high school. Not long, long, like, but you know, we had social media in high school not to the same degree that we have when that show aired, which was already five years ago or more. Um, but it's high school reflected, in my opinion, the most truthfully I've ever seen it. And uh, in because it, it doesn't change. Like that is what the time in your life is like. And it's... If, if done well, it can be evergreen and eternal, and it just matters if you capture that feeling or you don't. And I think in many ways, Dazed and Confused captures those feelings. Like, I, I remember the first time I went to a party at my friend's older brother's place. He had an apartment in the area. We smoked weed out of a Coke can with a hole cut in it. Ah. And I had my first cigarette and drank a little beer. I don't think it was the first time I drank, but like, yeah, like that feeling exists. And if you can mimic it correctly enough, like doesn't matter the time or the period of the place it just works sure and i think this movie does work pretty well uh i it's not my favorite of all time or anything like that but it's solid it's solid um and you know i i okay. guess that's yeah. my final thought like I, I, it is it like a lot of link ladder movies i think it's meant to evoke a feeling and it does it pretty well yeah i would agree um yeah, I would agree. Uh, I guess I'll dump, I'll jump in with my final thoughts. Um, I'd never seen this movie before. Um, I've only heard constant quotes. Um, I thought, honestly, I thought a little bit more would happen in the movie. But uh, <laughs> having watched it, I think I can kind of understand why the scenes where people were saying things kind of pop out. Because it does feel a little bit like one of those comedies where it just sort of would play in the background at a party. You might not watch the whole movie, but you'll probably see it in the background at a party and watch some of the movie. Uh, um, could I really quick say one yeah. other thing? Yeah. One of the things that's true about this movie uh, is that uh, when you are a freshman, seniors seem so fucking wise, and in retrospect, and they're old. just dumbasses. <laughs> Like, they're the same fucking dumbass you're going to be in four years. But at the time, if one deigns to acknowledge you and give you a little advice, you feel like fucking Aristotle is coming down from the mountain and being like, oh, mm -hmm. let me... Uh, I have got a boon from the gods. Yeah. Yeah, Prometheus right. gives you his fire. Right. Right. Like, yeah, But right. in reality, you look back on it and it's like, yeah, it's just some fucking guy. 
Yeah. Right. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's funny. Yes. Um, I agree. It, it's weird. I didn't have the same experience in high school, like as any of these kids. So for me, watching these movies about high school, it's always a very strange experience, kind of watching what people probably went through. Because I was very much a shut in for reasons that are completely outside the context of this. Didn't have a <laughs> ton of friends, um, but the ones I had, I was pretty close to. I was probably more like uh, the Adam Goldberg character than anybody else in this me movie. Me too. Um, me too. Yeah. So for me, I, I was think probably it, most like the Matthew McConaughey character. There you go. Okay, sure. <laughs> too, too old. You look just like him, buddy. You're a dead <laughs> ringer for him. <laughs> um, it's a weird movie. Like I enjoyed it. Um, yeah, I think it does kind of suggest summer to me, even if it wasn't like the entire summer. Um, it's weird that it takes hazing so lightly. Like, mm. That is a thing that aged kind of strangely, but it's also something that was sort of a, uh, I would say it was sort of a, an ongoing trope in coming of age movies about freshmen being beaten up by the seniors. Um, I don't think it was ever like as organized as this. And I think that the whole sense that seniors are beating up on freshmen to like break in the new meat was sort of a weird outlier from that time period. Uh, like, I don't think that if you had that in a movie now, people would be okay with it. I'm pretty sure if you had a bunch of people bullying freshmen uh, with paddles and weapons, they would probably say, no, this is gang, gang yeah, material or violence. You put that A24 movie, it'd be fine. You yeah. can't put it in a, like, <laughs> in but an like, A24 movie, sure. Yeah, but Linklater would only get made in A24. You can't get a yeah. major theatrical release unless it's about fucking Batman or one of the you know well yeah. like, i mean we're talking about a different thing now yeah but i'm just saying in terms of the context and the subject matter of like having children beat children like with bats they would probably you know it would be a disturbing take it wouldn't be something where they're like oh ha 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 let's go hang out with these buddies afterwards it would be like oh my god i was assaulted i was physically assaulted i'm gonna call the cops and that's where the movie would kind of stop i don't know i just um, watch bodies 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 and mm. I it's haven't watched fun. that yet. You know, like, I don't know. Different context. This is a different yeah. conversation. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah right. I, that's why. I think, I mean, I think I, the I, medium I, of movie making on a grand scale has channeled down to a very specific yeah. and very sure. annoying thing. And yeah. I mean, this would like, not be wide release now. You're right. Yeah. This would not I, be wide release. I liked that it was uh, a movie about high schoolers that were plainly doing drugs. There was a lot of things that mm. would have been not particularly okay in just the 80s, Reagan's. Let, I'll say this. So there is the nostalgia for certain things that we've talked about with these like coming of age movies. Uh, for me, part of it is indeed the fact that Movies could be about more things back then, like wide release movies. They cannot now. Mm -hmm. People use people always say like you couldn't make Blazing Saddles today. Like you couldn't make Dazed and Confused today, but it's not because it's too politically incorrect. It's because what is acceptable in the hyper capitalist 2020 market is not fucking a Dazed and Confused movie. Yeah. Yeah, like mid. Like it's right? not Maybe too controversial. Yeah. It's not too controversial. It's just right. I mean, honestly, this quite thing the would... opposite. I mean, like even in the yeah. same even in the same era, kids came out, right? You know, yeah. and that while not a huge wide theatrical release by any means, uh, did have some level of infamy. And I don't think Days of Confuse is all that wide of a release. Uh, this was still a pretty low budget movie for Linkletter, even for Universal being behind it and everything. They eventually distributed it. But I don't think it it was like designed back then. There was a we we've talked about this a lot. Back then there was a market for like middle market movies. You know, mm -hmm. like when you had these Google Plexes coming up with twenty four theaters, like you had to fill them with something. Well, now they just fill them all with Doctor Strange. They fill them all with Batman or whatever. Like they yeah. they have to have. And all Disney is a contract going. where you yeah. have to play yeah, it for exactly. six weeks at least. That, one of these days that is going to be back to adjudicated like the Paramount Act back in the fucking 60s. One of these well, days it's going to, a reckoning's going to have to happen. I, I have a feeling that we're not going to get there because before we get there, all the movie theaters are going to go out of business. Very true. 
Very true. This is true. In fact, the only thing keeping him in business is fucking Marvel. Yeah. So anyway. Uh, well, I live in a big yeah, city, so- at least, that has revival movie theaters who live on revival shit. So at least I can see I, the I've thing a in or its original mm-hmm. print or whatever. Yeah. <laughs> I, I've got a drive-in movie theater. You can watch the, this Halloween. They're having a triple feature for 11 bucks. Uh, Friday the 13th, uh, Nightmare on Elm Street, and Texas Chainsaw Massacre for 11 bucks. That's a deal. Shop around. That's you a can't fucking beat great deal. Uh, I'd go mm-hmm. if I lived in Pueblo. <laughs> uh, um, yeah. And it's a drive-in, too. Double. You know, like, we're one of the few towns that have a drive-in, too. It's great. Um, okay. Well, enough nostalgia humping for us, wouldn't we say? Um, mm-hmm. Okay. So, uh, before I get into... Uh, Texas Chainsaw would be a great choices. Dog Days of Summer movie, by the way. <laughs> It very much would be. It very much would be. But we've got our Halloween theme coming up here, so I might want to keep that in the yeah. in the in the hopper. Um, so okay, but before we do that, let's get down to points because everyone was pretty generous this time around. Uh, Chris Borth, you got a point from me about uh, the changing of the guard, the changing of the eras between the Hughes era and the '90s. Uh, Zach Powers, you got two points from Chris Borth. One uh, about identity uh, between uh, Mitch and Pink, and the one about uh, Gen X apathy. Uh, so yeah. you have 12 points for final voting. Bor, if you have 12 points, and I have 11 points for final voting. Both of you have one bonus point to give out. Um, and I have two. Okay, so uh, I sensed a theme going on here between Wet Hot American Summer and Days Confused, and I really did think, like, well, maybe I could go along with that. I could do, like, Fast Times or Ridgemount We have a sub-theme. Or, you know, uh, right, yeah, right, a theme within the theme. But then I thought, the hell with that. Uh, I'm not playing by your guys' rules. I'm going by the themes rules of hot summers and stuff. So then I thought about a mutual favorite I know between Zach and I about Barton Fink because that's really, you know, it's like a hot the time. building kind of catches on fire. It is a hot time. Um, I, I, I honestly thought that Borif was going to choose uh, Mad Max Fury Road. So the fact that he left that on the table, I thought I would probably shoot for that. Um, or Dune recently, but maybe that was just an excuse just for me to talk about either one of those movies. Um, but I mean, instead, Mad Max Fury I'm Road go, is 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 oh that's a, the a juggernaut. Best movie of the twenty tens, yeah, uh, best movie of the twenty tens. That movie rocks. Mm-hmm. Um, so, but I'm gonna go all the way back. Let's. I recently watched that uh, Paul Newman Joanne Woodward documentary, um, and it's very good. I recommend it. It's oh, okay. and sad, but. All right. um, so uh, I know what you're thinking. You're thinking Summer, Paul Newman, Cool Hand Luke, right? Not Russell. No, I'm know. not thinking Cool he Hand Luke. Gonna I'm choose. thinking of something he I was... referenced in the podcast we recorded right before this. <laughs> um, if we are doing, if it's um, the Long Hot Summer, uh, which is a based off of William Faulkner, uh, with Paul Newman, Joe Edward, and Orson <laughs> Welles, uh, 1958. Uh, I have not seen this movie pretty much since Paul Newman passed away. Uh, I remember not really caring for it all that much. Uh, so I thought I'd give it another go with the context of knowing more about uh, no. Joanna. I was thinking Paul Cat on a Hot Tin now. Roof. I was this close to doing it. This fucking close to doing it. But uh, I don't know. Uh, yeah, I don't know. I, I mean, and that's Tennessee Williams. But I thought William Faulkner. Eh, I'm going, I mean, you know, now I, one, now I feel another. bad that I didn't do Suddenly Last Summer. So we could have had a uh, movie about cannibalism <laughs> that was written, I that's, believe, by Tennessee Williams. See, that's what I'm saying. That's what I'm saying. Yeah. I, that's what I'm saying. For if you let me down with this pick. So, uh, uh, with Days of Confusion. Here's repeat the, the, let me down. Here's the repeat thing. the name one time, Russell. It is called The Long Hot Summer, 1958. Okay. I'm not, I don't think I'm familiar with this in any way. I've never heard of this one okay, before. Okay, great. But great. I think I've I learned my lesson on this. I have a feeling Borf's going to hate it. I have a feeling that I've learned my lesson on this because I chose a classic film that I hadn't seen yet as my pick. So I don't think I'm going to do that next right. time. I'm going to continue not seeing <laughs> classic films. <laughs> widely released movies that everyone tells me I should see. Days of Confused is pretty good. We'll see. We'll see. Yeah, I like no, this movie it's a, a lot. fair choice. I'm not saying it's disqualified. Is it I'm Wet Hot saying... American Summer good? Okay. Well, yeah, we'll and see. even but... Boris Palette of Taste, I know he could do better. Um, okay, okay. J- challenge accepted. Challenge accepted. Uh, okay. A quick point of note for order. Uh, the next episode is going to be the 50th of our. Uh, return. So yeah. Oh wow. wow! And I think we're I think we'll be starting our Halloween theme. Yeah, uh, we skipped our this, two year anniversary. Uh, we didn't do an episode okay. for that. Uh, we do need to think about our Halloween theme coming up. Uh, mm. Okay. Yeah, because that is the, we're getting we're already getting the, the we're already getting there, guys. The, the yeah. summer doesn't last forever, no. as uh, 
as you learn, unless you just well, got out of high school. Then I've got the, the list of forever. candidates for Halloween topics, you know, divided by century or by theme or whatever. Great. Uh, we can roll the big 20-sided die and cool. uh, make we'll it happen. Great. We'll crack uh, into yeah, it next so episode. That's cool. Yeah. That's right. Alrighty. Well, this has been fun, everybody. Uh, and I guess we're going to skid it out, out, out of here before the cops kick us out of the football field. Uh, Borif, I'm going to toss you the keys from the 50-yard line. I have been Russell Carlson. This has been Borif. Ugh. Ugh. Um, I'm never going to sign this. <laughs> I might play, but I'm never going to sign this. <laughs> and I've also been joined by Zach Powers. Uh, just pulling up the uh, Google article for the quotes. <laughs> uh, George Washington, he I, was in a cult. That's right, yeah. And, and you know, Martha... I, one of my, I'll, real quick, though, one of my favorite quotes that Slater says that Martha Washington was, like, getting bushels of pot. That bitch, Martha Washington Custis, never got a bushel of shit her whole fucking life, okay? That woman had other people to do that fucking for her. No fucking way was she out there harvesting weed by herself with her bare fucking hands. No way. Uh, I, I, um, I think that having that be your specific peccadillo of the entire thing you said, I sure I'll give that one to you. Sure. It was also saying <laughs> she was packing. I do want to say the money was green. I. I, I all right. Uh, I, I want to say just I to clarify, everybody, the shirt you're wearing. Uh, uh, on officially uh, uh, on the shit list for the movie trap. <laughs> Ray, Ronald Reagan, Nancy Reagan, and Martha Washington. <laughs> That's right. These are people who have been in the first Look it up. Who, who are on our shit list. That's mm -hmm. right. Mm -hmm. That's right. And, and look her up. Look her up. All righty, folks. Well, thanks for joining the movie trap. And as we always say on the movie trap, Diane Ladd is too young to play Chevy Chase's mom. Yeah, it's the movie trap from us. It's true. See you guys. You got a joint? Uh, no, not on me, man. <laughs> It'd be a lot cooler if you did. <laughs> all right, all right.